uh, Tommaso, who made the first presentation, uh, has addressed most of the questions that uh, you had raised, and those quiz, uh, and uh, uh, some of them have been posted in the chat. So please feel free to do so. And to the team that has just uh, completed, uh, team of Professor Mugabe, you have almost one million questions in the uh, <laughs> chat. Uh, please <laughs> take time and look at them, uh, because uh, then we may be able to give you a window to address a few of them. Otherwise, it is now my pleasure to pass the microphone to uh, Dr. Joanna Satella, our Director of uh, uh, Outreach Communication and Other Partnership, who will be leading uh, the panel discussion on my behalf. So, uh, Dr. Terry, I pass the microphone to you. Okay, thank you very much, Prof, and thanks everyone. Uh, really very insightful discussions we've had there. Um, yeah, I think we are now going to a session where we say this is where the rubber meets uh, the bullet, um, basically trying to see what does all these you know, ideas we're talking about in the context of STI, what do they mean in, in, in practice? You know, how do they sort of link to uh, some of the societal problems or challenges that, of, of course, have been described in this, in just the concluded uh, session. We've just heard about the fisheries and, and some of the challenges that are being uh, faced. And just to re-emphasize that uh, um, Kalisha's Juma believed in STI, which is uh, aligned or which is you know, able to solve societal problems. And I think this is one of the areas that as an organization, as ACTS, we are very passionate about, that as we pursue uh, the STI agenda, we are able to link this particular agenda to some of the um, challenges that, that the society faces. Uh, most importantly, of course, if you look at the Africa Agenda 2063, the pursuit about you know, knowledge-based economy and, and to be able to use uh, the STI you know, trajectory and, and, and capabilities uh, to not only solve the societal problems, but also to uh, strengthen the achievement of sustainable growth. This is very critical. So uh, this particular session is very key because it's going to put all the, 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 the concepts, um, the great theories, the great research that has been talked about into uh, sort of practice. And we're going to see where really, are, are we connecting really to the issues on the ground or, or the ground is uh, different as we politically normally say it in, in, in Kenya uh, that uh, yeah, the ground could be different, but let's, let's see. So I have a panel, um, um, a group of really very great people who are going to you know, give us some uh, initial perspectives about uh, the practical experiences that they are having. Um, and this is going to be uh, sort of a, a, you know, a panel discussion. And in the interest of time, I'm really going just to ask each of the panelists to give uh, maybe five to six minutes uh, presentation um, based on the topic uh, that, they, that they are looking at. We have uh, number one, Mr. Dave Okechi, who is a fish farmer in Kisumu County. And Dave is going to talk to us about digitizing the Lake Victoria Basin Fisheries for socioeconomic inclusion, very interesting. Digitizing has been known to be sometimes a bit exclusive, but this is a case where we are seeing a, a potential to use digitizing as an opportunity to bring a more inclusion. So it would be great to hear what Dave uh, has to tell us about this. And then we have Fred Juma, who is again a fisher farmer in Busia County. And Fred is going to talk to us about the entrepreneurism in fisheries and aquaculture, very important again. And, and we are going to have Professor Lars Kaufman, uh, who is a researcher at the University of Boston, and uh, also going to just talk to us about international research and capacity building priorities. We're talking about capability building for these um, uh, for these uh, systems. Uh, Dr. Paul Rina from Cambry, uh, and Paul will talk to us a bit about the policies and you know, how do policies link to some of these issues. And finally, um, our honorable, really great, you know, uh, a friend, uh, Alison Field Juma, um, who is the vice president of the CG Foundation. 
and she will tell us a bit about uh, potential capacity building. And Alison is great because she's very passionate about practical problems. So this is really key. So it's my pleasure to invite um, Dev Okechi to give a five minutes uh, presentation on digitizing LVB, like Victoria Basin, fisheries for socioeconomic inclusion. Dave, I'm going to be very keen and strict on time. So um, I don't know whether you want to use a PowerPoint, but I would prefer you just give your story as well. Dave, if you're there, please. Thank you so much. I had prepared a PowerPoint, so I'll just go straight into, into the PowerPoint presentation in a, just one minute. Right. Um, and the other presenters then, in the spirit of equity, if you have a PowerPoint, just make it ready so that we reduce the time lapse of loading the, the, the PowerPoint presentations. Are you able to see my screen? I've shared it. Yes. Great. Uh, thank you all very much. My name is Dave Okech, not Okech as it's, uh, as it's pronounced, but that's okay. I'm the CEO of Accurate Limited. We use technology um, and high quality inputs to enhance fish farmers' productivity, provide market access, promote equal trade, and building fish farmers' resilience um, to climate change. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to present. So uh, why is technology very important for the Lake Victoria Basin uh, uh, establishment? Um, Technology essentially is supposed to promote uh, equal opportunities for those who are excluded and uh, eliminate discri discrimination. And that's why as a company, we have uh, a strong emphasis on using technology to reach out to a uh, select group of people in the society that we feel are actually excluded from benefiting from the proceeds that will come out of what you'll define as, as blue economy at the moment. So we have two types of technology that we refer to here. The digital technology, which is our mobile app-based application that is IoT powered. IoT means internet of things. It enables farmers to practice what is called precision fish farming. And through that, we are linking the fish produce from the number of farmers that we work with directly to the fish traders who are largely women and youth who rely on fish as a socioeconomic uh, way, means of life on a day to day. Uh, two, we have the physical technology or the hardware, that's the cage fish farming that is now being promoted in the lake, which uh, uh, we are developing what is called contractual fish farming that will enable the part of the uh, society, that's largely women and youth again, who do not have the financial might to buy this technology to be able to acquire this on a lease to purchase agreement. Some of the impacts that we are witnessing as a result of uh, what you call digitizing the aquaculture sector, we have both economic, social, and uh, environmental impact. Um, socially, there is a result in uh, gender empowerment, meaning women and youth uh, are able to comfortably access fish information at the comfort of their phones. And that's promoting what is called decent jobs uh, and contributing towards elimination of uh, vices that exist in the um, uh, fisheries and aquaculture sector, such as the sex for fish trade. That is actually at times prevalent because of lack of information about the alternative sources of fish. So we are, as a company, enabling women and youth to access fish at the comfort of their funds using this technology. And that is going a long way in terms of digitizing uh, the aquaculture sector. Economically, we have uh, realized as a result of the implementation of the Aquarage app, increased access to fish. Of course, I mentioned that. There is uh, increased revenue to farmers by up to 60%. Um, this is because farmers within these areas are able to access the high quality and affordable fish feeds which uh, we are importing at the moment, and it's contributing towards reducing their production period from 13 months to eight months. And uh, this is, in, is, real, is leading to increased productivity. By farmers realizing increased productivity up to 40%, it means more fish is available to the community and 
less cases of malnutrition are actually taking place because of now less reliance on wild caught fish, which is depleted, and more reliance on farmed fish, which is farmed by digital aquaculture, I will say so. Environmentally, this is also contributing towards reduction of greenhouse gas emission. I really like what Professor Callistas shared about where you talked of sustainable uh, uh, socioeconomic uh, empowerment of communities in Africa through use of technology. And for technology to be sustainable, we must look at the environmental aspect of it. Digitizing aquaculture is leading towards reduction of greenhouse gas emission. Why? Because farmers are now getting access to floating pellets, which are less detrimental to the ecosystem of the lake because they float and they don't sink, and therefore leading to less pollution of lakes and rivers. So what does uh, digitizing the Lake Victoria Basin include? It, it, uh, for us, we are looking at deployment of IoT technology, Internet of Things, to as many smallholder fish farmers are, as possible and deployment of artificial intelligence. We are currently in the process of uh, um, uh, designing an AI software that is going to uh, enable smallholder fish farmers to count the number of fish that they have, get the average grammage of the fish, and be able to identify diseases at an early stage and hopefully arrest the situation to make the sector more, more resilient, also against uh, diseases and, uh, and changes in, uh, in climatic conditions. Uh, we can't wait for this new product to come out. Hopefully in the next uh, uh, three to six months, we'll have it out. But so far, we have managed to deploy IoT sensors, which are supporting pre precision fish farming uh, for the smallholder farmers in the lake. Thank you. I hope I've taken exactly five minutes. Yeah, yeah, sorry, my, my, my connection seemed to be unstable, uh, but Devi, um, I, miss, I missed you in the last few seconds. So you, you're done, no? Yes, I'm done. Excellent. Okay, so, so I think I got most of your point until the last few seconds, um, uh, which, which I think was just conclude, uh, uh, about concluding. Um, yeah, it, I was actually looking forward to listening to your your perspective on how digitization contributes to addressing some of the illegal um, fishing, which is a major cause of exclusion and then breaking that boundary. Uh, but but that's, that's something we can discuss uh, moving forward. I want to usher in the next speaker, who is uh, Fred Juma from Busia County. Fred, you have five minutes, please. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Fred Juma from Busia County, as mentioned. Uh, I present on a social ent on entrepreneurship through our culture. Yeah, you, you can see my slide there uh, uh, on entering areas that uh, we are looking at as a source of for livelihood and a source of uh, food for nutrition. Uh, we understand also that uh, life below water, that is SDG number 14, is an important uh, SDG that could also help us meet quite a number of SDGs. Uh, uh, or even accelerate the progression of SDG. Aquaculture trends in Kenya are quite uh, uh, interesting. We we have already a deficit, and it is now a deficit of over 500 ton annually. And uh, cross border conflict is increasing, and there is also a decline in capital fisheries, while the, the, the local production is also low, but export, uh, import of fish 
cost increasing while the export is also declining. As we look at it from an entrepreneurship point of view, uh, an entrepreneur always comes in to solve a problem. You cannot be able to bring in a business case if you are not solving a problem. Otherwise, the business will not be sustainable. There are quite a number of business opportunities in aquaculture, right from the time the, the young fish is, uh, is uh, hatched, that is the prime production, to fish feeding, to those who are doing ornamental, those who are fabricating cages, a form of technologies. Uh, the, most of the people who are owning cages, they don't feed the cages themselves, they have employed people. That's also a form of uh, uh, business for some people. Uh, right up to value addition and ensuring that that fish reaches the market. It presents quite a number of opportunities. But there are also equally a number of challenges in agriculture, uh, which uh, one has to tackle carefully, and it calls for various innovations because some of the solutions are not readily available on the shelves. You have to think, you have to really find out how do I solve this problem. And this has to be informed by some data, some information to be able to realize some impact. We are looking at it also from a culture point of view that uh, it's not just on its own. For us to meet the food system outcomes, that is economic, social well-being, food nutrition and environmental sustainability, we look at the entire system, the food system, the human system, and the natural system, so that uh, we we make it sustainable and for the activity of our culture to be able to, to coexist with the natural setting. We are located at, uh, at, at uh, Port Victoria, uh, right in Busia County. You can see in that map, this is an area that for history it has been receiving a lot of Nile, Nile Lapia, and Nile, Nile patch fish from Uganda, and that has been a major landing site in the years back in the 80s, 90s, up to around 2000, when uh, there were some changes in the economic alignments in the region, such that all the fish that were coming at Port Victoria are no longer coming instead, uh, and that really made a lot of challenges for the most local fishers. And uh, having uh, just a 6%, Kenya having just 6%, uh, it was not possible for the farmers or the fishermen to be continue crossing over. This has a lot of conflict. So we looked at it and uh, saw that uh, look, when you look at that map, the green part indicates the most suitable sites that have been marked out by the Kenya fisheries as suitable areas for cage fish farming. So we positioned ourselves at that location so that we are able to provide uh, fish fingerlings, be able to provide the feed supply and be able to support the fisher farmers or the fish, uh, fishermen who are working in the area. Uh, currently, you can see in the photo, the, the, the cages that are being deployed are quite uh, they are metallic in form, some are very small in size, even uh, making it economical for some farmers, it's not possible. But we are looking forward in the future where with the innovations and technology, we are able to access bigger cages, as you can see there, the one uh, that is circular cages, which can hold as high as uh, 18 tons in one production. So this presents uh, opportunities and challenges along the same way. And the uh, Victoria Fish uh, Farm, which is primarily a social enterprise, uh, and the, a social enterprise that is, uh, has presented a case uh, where we are doing both fish cages. Uh, we are also producing fish fingerlings and supplying to the farmers, over 2,300 farmers in Western Kenya. They are able to access uh, their fingerlings in a sustainable way that are portable rates. We are doing about 1.5 million fingerlings annually. And uh, in the process of doing this, we realize that farmers, as we interact with them, they are having several challenges, not just the fingerling problem, but there's also a question of the feed. The feed sector or the feed millers, the prices of the feed that we arrive at the fish farmers are very high and it's not sustainable any longer. Farmers are finding it very difficult to really exist or even continue doing fish. Fish, uh, fish farming activities. So we came up with a concept where we are integrating and ensuring that the, the resources, the interaction with the community 
it's able to be done in a way that we protect the environment as well. So we established, uh, we set up um, technology on a black soldier fly farm, and we are slowly trained uh, about 40 groups of people who are working and slowly they have adapted and learned that they can actually use the black soldier insects to be able to reduce the cost of feed. Uh, and over time, we are looking at also some of the innovations we are practicing, uh, like the waste or the grass that remains from the black soldier, which feeds on organic waste. It can be used in vegetable farming, kitchen gardens, so that the farmer, uh, nothing goes to waste and they're able to reduce their cost of production. And uh, also we are currently uh, using some of the technologies like the solar, solar powered uh, CTV running on 4G internet access, uh, solar flood lighting systems, which we are working together with the Bunyala Fish Farmer Association to help and support the farmer to be able to have more lighting and improve the issues of security. Because the fishermen who used to get much fish from the lake are no longer getting it, but the cage fish farming activities that, they, that are going on, however small they are, they are the ones supporting the fish supply in the local and even the supplies to as far as Nairobi, Busia, and other areas. So we are using a 4G uh, powered, uh, which are accessed by phones, by smartphones, to be able to visualize and see when you are wherever Nairobi, wherever you are in their house, you can see exactly who is standing at your cage. And you, they, they, they also have, uh, they also have uh, speakers. You can actually speak to that individual and ask them, what are you doing on my cage? Or uh, if they are workers, uh, they can actually give you immediate feedback whether there are any issues with the fish that they have seen in the world. So in pipeline, we are looking at establishing a, a first organic fish feed plant in Kenya, which is going to be doing about two tons per hour capacity. We have been uh, supported through an inclusive grant by World Bank or the Kenya Climate Smart Project. We are to raise additional funds from uh, other investors, other from the financial institutions, so that we are able to realize this uh, facility that is actually going to work and rely on an uh, insect, insect based uh, protein. And uh, this is going to reduce the pressure around the feed that people have been having. And it's also going to sort out the environmental issues and provide the, that are, are very prevalent in the markets that we, we cover around. This is the kind of thing that we have already identified in, in China that we are looking at to see how it can help us uh, reduce the cost. You realize that the, most of the feeds that are currently used, they are either imported or they are processed. Uh, Fred, I'm going to ask you to summarize. Um, I'm going to request you to summarize. And... So basically, I'm emphasizing by saying that uh, that feed processing is going to be supported and uh, being supported by through the women activities the waste processing so that we are able to realize more feed and more other opportunities along the value chain. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fred. And now I bring in uh, of Les Kaufman from Boston. Uh, Kaufman, you heard what is happening at the local level, and, and it would be good to hear from you um, in terms of building some of these capabilities and, and trying to profile some of these innovations that are already taking place. What 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 is happening? What are the opportunities for you know, building uh, capacity? What are the priorities from where you sit? Yeah, thank you, everybody. You... Can, can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Okay, okay. So uh, I'm just going to go over the main points because time is short, but overarching. Uh, thoughts are one, that technology and science can transform and accelerate cage aquaculture. But if we do everything we need for cage aquaculture, those practices are going to transform society. And second, uh, it's, it when we talk about technology, the technology is just a tool. What really matters here is knowledge and the sharing of knowledge and technology can facilitate that. So the four uh, points I'd like to consider 
are just advancing cage aquaculture. I'm not talking about pond culture because in many ways it's a different sector unless one company is doing both. Uh, we have the problem of balancing cage aquaculture with wild capture fisheries. We can't just be thinking in a tunnel about one or the other. Um, both have to be considered in the context of overall ecosystem sustainability. And when we think about Lake Victoria, the ecosystem is not just everything that's underwater, it's the entire lake basin, because that's where the water comes from. Uh, and uh, the water is often bringing with it things we don't want going into the lake. And finally, we'll talk briefly about training and capacity building. Now, several key points are entry points for technology where it could be useful in advancing cage aquaculture. The first is optimal siting and planning. Um, John Okechi of Kimfrey, Chris Nyamwea, and I have been looking at, and Paul Arena, who probably will speak to this, uh, have been looking at what is the limit of cage aquaculture that would be sustainable, first in Kenya, uh, in any one village, or in the lake as a whole. And uh, it's large, but it may not be as large as people are thinking. It's not limitless. Um, this sudden explosion of cage aquaculture requires renewable energy um, to keep it going uh, so that we're not increasing demand on wood and fossil fuels. All of the aquaculture futures are tied up in how well we manage the watershed. Are we preserving our swamps, which is particularly important in Siaya and uh, Busia and Bunyala. And uh, these swamps are a potential to clean the water before it gets to the lake. But we've short circuited them and polluted water is going straight into the lake, often in areas that would be suitable for aquaculture. We desperately need veterinary support. We need to digitize the aquaculture system so that you have a heads up display. What is going on in your cages? Where are their problems? Uh, we need sustainable feedstocks that are plant or insect-based instead of fish-based or other sources of animal protein. Introducing native species like the ones depicted here back into culture could expand the market, uh, expand the diversity of offerings to local consumers and actually contribute to species conservation. And finally, all of this depends upon rapid digital communications and broadly accessible broadband internet. Now, balancing wild and capture fisheries is partly about science, but it's mostly about communication. We need more lake-wide monitoring to understand how what's going on in Kenya is related to what's going on in the rest of the lake. We have regular commercial surveys uh, that also look at limnology and recently begun to look at biodiversity, but they're inadequately funded. And we don't have enough people, enough technical support. We need tech centers. This is something I discussed with Colestis in each country that integrate and share all of the data from remote sensing, ground data from the cages in the lake and our science modeling and forecasting ecosystem-based management that takes all of this into account is critical. And finally, we need to reintegrate the balkanized departments of the fisheries department in Kenya, connect them more efficiently with the research arm, Kimfrey, and together have a common vision for ecosystem-based management. Now, a lot of science needs are second, thought of as secondary, but they're really critical. One is regular lake basin biodiversity surveys, having robust museum collections so people can identify the fish, and to use area management and community-based conservation to protect lake basin habitats and prevent important species from going extinct. Finally, we need to rethink training and capacity building. We need a league of lake basin angels who are young scientists in ecology, aquaculture, tech, sociology, anthropology, and economics. 
they need to work together as an interdisciplinary team to get around some of this stovepiping that's a problem. We need to ensure equal opportunities across genders, ethnicities, and backgrounds. There's a huge range of educations, but anybody can learn enough to participate. And finally, as part of the ecosystem approach, we need to better integrate uh, the wildlife service, forestry, agriculture, and urban planning with fisheries and fisheries research. So there's a holistic context for aquaculture and it all fits the national development plan and our efforts to meet SDGs. Remember, knowledge is the fuel. Technology is just the engine. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Um, yeah, that's that's key. Good cutting shot. Uh, Paul, what is the policy situation of all this? Paul, you have five minutes. Florina. Yes, I'm there. Go ahead. Okay, fine. Are you able to see my presentation? Very well. Perfect. So I have five minutes. By five, I should be done. It's quite a number of slides, but I'm going to be very brief on this. So uh, the history of aquaculture, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity, and I appreciate the previous presenters, including Les, whom we are working closely with the aquaculture, especially in Kenya, now that we are zeroing down on Kenya, dates back to the 1910, 1921. A lot of work has been done to support aquaculture in this country. And I want to recognize the fact that the government has put quite a lot of resources. The private sector has contributed. And uh, as you look at the graph, the pie chart there, of course, Nigeria. Previously, we talked about various countries from the earlier presenters as we began this meeting. And you'd see Nigeria taking a very big chunk of this. And uh, we can see the percentage that Kenya is taking, a great concern, and that's where the issues of climate change, innovation and technology coming in, and the productivity in the country, as you can see, has been oscillating. And this has got a lot to do with people getting excited when they, are support, they support, and all of a sudden when it's not working for them because of uh, the kind of systems they're running, again, probably they slow down, and you know, they enable us in, in aquaculture sector. If they are lacking, then you see the kind of oscillations we are seeing in the statistics in terms of productivity. Um, some of the works that are going on, of course, Jadida talked about the improvement of the seed. And uh, I know this one, again, Kalista talked about it, uh, about uh, genetic improvement. And that's one of the things that uh, uh, we are working on, of course, and other private sector are also working on that. And we hope that in this direction, we shall have a much stronger seed fast grower seed and more resilient to challenges, but of course, increasing incomes, the value chain actors. And of course, the government is leading this with the private sector. There is also the consideration of indigenous species. We have had a hype of people running out, wanting to bring in the YY seed and the many others, many strains. But again, we think about our own indigenous species. How many species do we have around that uh, are, uh, you know, consumer preference, and how can we bring them on board? We have Ningu. Ningu is very common along the, you know, the Lake Victoria Basin and is a delicacy. But uh, I mean, it's not available and needs to come into aquaculture. How possible can this be? Um, tilapia jipe, the one on the, you know, on the far right, that is an endemic species in Lake Jipe and uh, towards the Kenyan coast in the border of Tanzania. How can we bring this back into aquaculture so that the local community which links up with this fish very well, can be able to uptake aquaculture and ensure food security. And further to that, there's also the aspect of feed, which is also very, very critical. And all these aspects I'm talking about, innovation and technology, enabling uh, policies are very, very critical. Yes, there's a lot that is going on. We have quite a lot of commercial industries in the country currently. We have uh, the government also led support. We have the private sector, small scale and large scale engaging in feed production. But then the big question would be, at the end of the day, what uh, uh, are we able to break even as investors? What is it that is not making it possible for feed production in this country? 
Uh, there are also alternatives in terms of research. What alternatives can we have as, as a feed ingredient so that we are able to cut the cost? And there are quite a lot of tests going on. The macrophytes that are so rich in the Lake Victoria Basin, uh, we are trying to exploit this to see the possibility of being able to in, bring them up so that we can do the cost. The black soldier fly, one of our centers in Sagana is working on this and we are hoping that it can also create a shift. We know the other parts of the world already, they are way ahead of us. And how do we work with farmers in the private sector so that we are able to, be able to uptake this and run away with it? More often than not, the government leads, but the private sector runs away with this. Of course, Kemfri has a, sm a small facility that is producing feeds, and this is able to you know, guide the industry. There is the aspect of live feed production. Those are also at trial levels, but they have succeeded elsewhere. Why wouldn't they succeed in this country too? Uh, the other aspect is the technologies, of course, the various types of ponds that we use, and people are trying all uh, approaches. Very, very critical. My presentation will be more imagery, already less has talked about the cages, I will talk about that. But the listeners, the viewers who are in the other end of Busia are looking at these images is the approach that we need now to pass it to, to ensure that we are able to produce enough. But are there policies that are going to support us on this? I'm going to wind up with that eventually in this presentation. Kenyan Coast is also working hard, uh, a little bit of uh, slackness, but they are working so much on prawns and mud crabs and seaweed. But there are also conditions that are supposed to be prevent accessibility of land at the Kenyan Coast is a big challenge and economic status of the community groups. More often than not, they do things at community level. That also needs to be looked at. The technology such as the in-point raceway technology, which is already a first one in Egypt, Kenya has had to come up with one. Of course, there are above ground ponds, which can be done in small uh, landholders. Very, very useful, especially at the backyard. And especially where there's enough sun, you can actually work with the solar to run your system. You don't have to use electricity. Uh, this is the first one of the Kenyan in pond raceway. They were, the first one I showed was Egyptian. And so Kenya is adopting this. Probably this will be the game changers. But there are few impediments to these high production technologies which are offshore, away land-based aquaculture. Of course, the hatcheries, Jadida talked about the hatcheries. There's quite a lot going on, greenhouse technology, um, corrugated iron sheets, wooden structures with tanks inside. And the farmers have gone this way and they're now they're intensifying their seed production. Uh, and we are seeing more regulated systems in terms of seed production, unlike before. Uh, and the other thing is on value addition. Once the fish is ready, there is need to ensure that this fish gets to the market on, in what state are we able to value add the fish so that we make more money. This is critical so that we're able to change people's uh, you know, incomes and, and economic status. But also for the less consuming societies, they want probably the fish packaged in a different way for them to be able to take. And this enhances nutrition. And we know that even in, we will talk about Busia and the various counties. I know Kemfri is playing a big role with the private sector, AAK and the others in terms of promoting the various value added products. I'm just coming to the end of this presentation. We are also having materials of our innovations and technologies, which are you know, being shared when we are meeting in forums so that people are able to take this home and try it because probably the ability to be able to come to the centers is not possible. And so we package these materials for the sake of sharing. Now, a critical one, um, aquaculture market information platform. Um, the farmers may not know where the consumer is. The consumer doesn't know where the farmer is. This is critical and this is what Dave talked about. It's critical that we have this technology so that people are able to meet at you know, a virtual market and they're able to trade. And so goods and services are, are able to move left, right without necessarily physically traveling from one point to another. And I know uh, we are working with them on this and it's making much progress. Coordination between the national government and the counties, the research and the counties, public and private sector, very critical for policy uh, initiatives. These are things that we are supposed to do with the counties and the national uh, authorities. Policy gaps, very, very critical. I was given five minutes, I've eaten three minutes out of that. I apologize. I'm winding up. Lack of support on budget allocation at county levels. 
That's what was winding up with the image on counties. Uh, the changes that have happened from national to devolution, there's less resources allocated to fisheries and aquaculture, very critical. Poor national and county synergy on sector promotion. There's been a little bit of friction between national and county, and therefore there is need to synergize and you know, work together as, as one country and ensure that the sector grows. There are no clear guidelines yet on cage culture. This is something that we've been talking um, again and again in forums. It's high time the guidelines need to come out so that the investors don't receive setbacks of warnings and intimidations of uh, you know, being uh, thrown out of the investment. No consultative approaches to policies, frameworks, and regulations. Bring all the stakeholders on board during your discussions on these uh, institutions that are supposed to govern uh, aquaculture so that it is embraced and they're able to move with you and know how best they can invest. High power tariffs. Yes, this is quite restrictive when it comes to innovation technologies, and it's critical that these factors are considered. Otherwise, they become too prohibitive. You want to run our paddles, aeration systems. You can't run in Kenya with this because the power tariffs are very high. High import duty. The cost of feeds in Uganda is cheaper than in Kenya, yet they pass the same feeds through the Kenyan port. Something that really needs to be reviewed in terms of our policy approaches and you know, import duties. Restrictive movement of genetic material. This is either positive or negative, if not well applied. So I leave it, it's a double-edged sword for all of us. And favorable fish market competition, I wind up with that. We know there is a lot of importation of fish. How are we going to protect our local fish producers? Thank you so much. And uh, I apologize for taking- Thank you, uh, thank you, Paul. Questions. All very, very interesting insights there. Thank you so much. I'm very sure there'll be a lot of questions towards you. So let me bring in Alison Juma um, to just talk about some of the potential capacity building um, in the Lake Victoria Basin Fisheries and Aquaculture. Alison, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have no slides, so I'll just speak. Uh, and it's just wonderful to see so many familiar names and faces and to meet new people. And I just want to thank you all for your work for the Lake Basin communities. I wanted to just mention four overarching ideas. Angela will talk a bit more about the applications by the foundation, but there were some ideas in these, this session's excellent presentations on how to think about capacity building. The first I'd like to mention is what I call thinking like a watershed. Uh, Professor Kaufman alluded to this, um, which is that everyone is both upstream and downstream of someone else. And whether it's physically, such as a farmer uh, upstream on the river in Zoya, affecting someone fishing in Lake Victoria, or in the economic system, you can have uh, aquaculture stimulating the local ecology, economy as we've discussed, or competing with others for limited resources. So we always need to think about our effects on others and the other part of thinking like a watershed is really integrating different fields, whether it's ecology or biology, economics, sociology, business, and both to avoid the negative impacts and to see the positive possibilities. My next point is something that I've learned from working on climate adaptation, which is that we cannot afford the time nor the money to not have co-benefits. And this really relates to the question of supply chains, about how our renewed focus on supply chains can have multiple positive impacts on land use and on livelihoods, uh, as Fred, Fred Juma described very nicely. My third point, no surprise to anyone, is that effectively building and using information technology and IT networks is key. We need to advocate and work for the infrastructure that we need to effectively communicate. And we need to gain and build local and regional knowledge uh, and access global knowledge. And lastly on that one is to share that knowledge to increase the impact through educating, self-education, training, et cetera. My last point is, is just to, to open up our minds to seek new ideas. As you 
as you know, Calestis um, was all about discovering new ideas and experimenting with them. We want to expose ourselves to new ideas and try piloting those new, new innovations. That often involves risking failure, but it's worth it. So uh, the foundation, the Calestis Juma Legacy Foundation is in its startup phase. And whatever we do, we need to raise the money to do it. That's what being in a startup phase is, I guess. Um, and, and the way we're doing this really is to work with partners in particular uh, who are aligned with our values like ACTS within the Lake of Victoria Basin and globally to strengthen their work and to bring on the ground work to the basin. Also to create a local digital learning hub or resource center to enable access to global information and to share information and use that knowledge that might be made of bricks and mortar, it might be virtual, it can take different forms as circumstances and needs allow. We want to support innovation. We can do that in many ways through contests and things like that. And lastly, convening thought leaders, which is really like in this seminar, improving the understanding of policy and how it affects change and the values of environmental sustainability, gender equity, and supporting the productive role of youth in local economies. We want to strengthen the feedback loop between policy and on the ground work, as you are hearing in this last session, that practice should inform policy and institution building, as well as the other way around. So what would we like to see happen in Lake Victoria Basin? I thought John Mugabe set out the goals in his case study beautifully. Peace, justice, and strong institutions. And I would just add to that, that all of those three things rest on a healthy and resilient lake ecology, which, which gets us back to thinking like a watershed. So once we have the vision, let's build the steps from that vision, going from the bottom up, and I want to just thank you all and uh, back to, to our facilitator for the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. Very commendable and, and really focused points, uh, which I think uh, put everything that we are trying to talk about into perspective. Uh, before I hand it over to Prof. Gada to basically take, you know, you know, take us through the the discussions and close uh, with the session three, I just want to highlight a few things that I think have emerged from this discussion. Number one is that uh, um, there's already quite substantial innovations going on in the ground, trying to solve some of the problems. And in this case, uh, the Fisher Fox, um, some of the issues that they face. And these issues include uh, things to do with the um, you know, a lack of inclusion, gender discrimination, lack of information, empowerment, and of course, lack of proper uh, upscaling. However, it's very clear that uh, in all this that is happening, there's really very little reference to research in terms of how is research interacting or interplaying this particular uh, innovation. So that shows you that really uh, there's a big gap in terms of, you know, the research that is ongoing. It appears like research is taking um, you know, one direction and some of these practical um, experiences and, uh, and undertakings are also taking their own direction. So that para, you know, parallel movement of uh, the research and the, the practical uh, things, best practices taking place on the ground, I think needs to be uh, closed uh, down in terms of bringing uh, this together. And I think just to highlight that there is a huge potential uh, by the government and the private sector to be able to act as knowledge brokers. I like Paul's presentation, which has basically shown how basically uh, a lot of the work, the knowledge that is it is being generated from different cadres uh, is, is being translated to, 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 to support some practical solutions. This includes things to do with um, improved seeds, uh, information platforms, which I think also Alison has, has strengthened the need for, for, for sharing. 
And just to say that uh, it is really possible to ensure that the STI work uh, that, that, that has been done over the years, the investment, the dreams of Kalisha's Juma in terms of pioneering STI that is basically solution oriented. This is possible to be achieved. And for us to achieve this, uh, there'll be need for closer working relationship between the different uh, uh, partners. The government and the private sector, they're already doing a lot in terms of brokering things in, into the ground. They're putting in place practical initiatives. The research, I think we are still a bit lost in the theories and, and the concept. And I think the need, and I hope this kind of platform can be able to start talking about some of these issues so that we bridge that gap and ensure that the kind of research that we do is linked, is you know, linked much more closer to, to, to the solutions that we expect um, uh, in the society. And of course, in line with the sustainable development goals. At this point, I want to stop and thank all our panelists for really very insightful uh, perspectives and contributions, and I hope we are going to continue this discussion. This is not an end um, to this, and as all the speakers have said, we need to continue engaging and ensuring that we share as much as possible in a much more progressive way. So it's my pleasure to welcome back Prof. Gada to be able to take us to the next 